Okay. Thank you very much for joining. Can you hear me well? Okay. Louder? Louder? Okay. Is this just for the... Yeah, it's just for the, the camera. All right. So this is just for the camera. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for joining. This is going to be a quick, uh, quick talk about making open source hardware for retro gaming on Raspberry Pi. A disclaimer, I'm here out of my comfort zone. First of all, because I'm not a gamer. I'm pretty lame at playing games, actually. All right. For the camera. Okay. And uh, I'm even not a retro computing expert, but I'm an open source enthusiast and I'm a software engineer. Actually, I'm a professional software engineer, and what I'm going to share with you here uh, is uh, something that I do as a hobby, because although I'm not good at games, I um, really enjoy uh, making things. So the agenda for today is um, designing a um, gamepad uh, inspired by the classical uh, gamepads from the 80s or uh, late 70s. Uh, I'll explain what is open source hardware. I believe most of you have, are already familiar with it. And after that, I'll show you the steps for um, open source hardware gadget that I created from the hardware to the to the software. And finally, uh, we'll just um, briefly mention one of the most popular GNU Linux distribution for playing retro games, particularly on Raspberry Pi. How many of you have a Raspberry Pi? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is there anyone without a Raspberry Pi here? OK, a few people. All right. <laughs> All right, so I think this slide is redundant. <laughs> Obviously, everyone knows it, but a Raspberry Pi is pretty much a single, uh, single board computer, super, super popular with Bro Broadcom ARM system on a chip. There are numerous versions of Raspberry Pi. It's important to say that five years ago, in 2014, the Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, released um, a Raspberry Pi with 40-pin header. And since then, all Raspberry Pi models and versions are with 40-pin headers. So a gamepad is obviously, <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of that. Uh, this is something taken from Wikipedia. So one of the uh, old gamepads that uh, the photo is also taken from uh, Wikipedia. So uh, as a kid, I was used to playing with these gadgets. I believe most of you are also familiar with them. So I decided that I want to create an add-on board that I can plug on the Raspberry Pi with a similar shape, super, something super simple. And here is how I did it. Um, since I'm a Linux user, I try to use free and open source software pretty much all the time. And um, I got um, interested in uh, uh, KiCad or KiCad. Uh, so this is a free and open source software for designing, um, for designing hardware. The good thing is that it runs on numerous platforms. Uh, it's been actively developed. Uh, and it's an old project. It's, uh, it has more than uh, 20 years of history. Tomorrow at the open and uh, CAD room, the leading developers and contributors to uh, KiCad uh, will be sharing details. So if you're interested in learning more about the project, you can visit their talk as well. Uh, you can make uh, numerous uh, layers of a, a printed circuit board. Um, and it's already adapted by the industry. I got inspired using uh, KiCad uh, because of a company called Olimex. I'm living in the same city. They're making uh, a lot of uh, workshops. So it was good even for a person like me, I'm a software engineer, to make really simple two-layer um, hardware prototypes and boards. How many of you are actually uh, making hardware, designing PCBs? OK, that's a fair, fair amount of you. Very good. I hope that at the end of this talk, uh, everyone will get inspired. You see that's uh, really easy to do it, and uh, you can make something like this on your own as well. So the ingredients for a, a retro gamepad are super simple, obviously. You need a bunch of buttons, four buttons for movement, A, B, and buttons, and um, uh, of course, the select and start buttons. Since I'm doing this, I decided to, to put a few I squared C slots so that I during the day when I'm not playing, obviously, <laughs> retro gaming, I have to work at that part of the day. I can put some sensors and monitor uh, the temperature, the humidity at home. Uh, one thing that is specific for a Raspberry Pi is the secondary um, I2C bus, which is for an EEPROM. I'm going to do a quick deep dive in a few minutes. So here are the schematics. Uh, so 
in terms of schematics, here you see the bunch of the bunch of buttons. Here is the EE prom. I'll explain what's the purpose in it. Actually, this is the most interesting part of the whole project. And here are the additional I squared C slots for plug and play sensors. This is how the PCB new in Kika looks. A super simple board. Um, Pretty much this is the most simple thing that you can do as an add-on board for a Raspberry Pi because it's just a bunch of boards. After, after creating the board in KiCad, I have, I have exported it uh, as Gerber files and using a PCB a manufacturer, I have created this thing. This is how it looks. You can see it's from the PCB new to this one. Of course, this is assembled. So how many of you are familiar with open source hardware? OK. Not all of you. So this slide is important. I believe if you're here, you're an open source enthusiast, and we know very well what is free and open source software. And open source hardware has the same spirit. Basically, the idea is that whoever is creating a hardware can share the sources under appropriate open source uh, hardware license so that other people uh, can study, modify, uh, create a, uh, additional uh, products based on this original de device, uh, design. So um, it's, um, it, and making an open source hardware device has several ingredients. It's not just the hardware. Uh, it's good to, to do an entirely open source project that involves both the software and the hardware. And because uh, a lot of individuals and companies are claiming that they're open source, but they're just releasing PDFs, which are not enough for you to go home and uh, order and make a PCB out of the, PC, uh, out of the PDF. Uh, several years ago, uh, um, Open Source Hardware Association was established, and uh, they are running a certification of open source hardware. It is a free service that they're providing. So if someone is making an open source hardware, he can go there, certify it for free, the good thing is that when someone is browsing for open source hardware projects, he can go to their directory and see, hey, yeah, that's really open source hardware. Of course, there are a lot of open source hardware products that are entirely open source, but uh, people haven't, um, haven't certified them yet. This is how the certification looks of the product that you just see. So this is pretty much the end of the, uh, of the first part of the, of the presentation, which was about hardware, and now I would like to spend a little bit more time talking about device tree. Um, I know that this is a little bit uh, far away from the retro gaming, but this is an interesting uh, part, and this is actually the ingredient in this whole project, very simple project, that connects the hardware and um, the software. So how many of you are Linux users? Okay. And how many of you are familiar with the device tree? OK. All right. So device tree is basically a specification for um, software data structure that describes the hardware. Uh, the idea is that the device tree is, uh, is a pre-compiled binary outside of the Linux kernel, which allows single compiled Linux kernel to run within a wider uh, uh, range of uh, devices within one architecture. Uh, so you have a device tree binary blob here and device tree, uh, uh, device tree source. So basically, there is a compiler, DTC, that compiles the device tree source to DTB. So why I'm, I'm telling you this? Because when you have a bunch of buttons, and we have it in this particular project for a gamepad, uh, it's, it's good to, to make it work out of the box. And the device tree is the mechanism that allows you just to plug the board on top of the Raspberry Pi, put the device tree binary blob on the EE prompt that you saw on the previous slides, and automatically the operating system and the bootloader will boot this uh, binary, device tree binary overlay. So the device tree binary overlay itself, it enables the device tree binary to be extended um, and each device tree overlay contains a number of fragments. Uh, with the default uh, Raspberry Pi uh, bootloader provided in distributions like Raspbian, there is a config.txt file on the FAT partition uh, in which you can specify manually uh, the device tree binary overlay that should be loaded. Those of you who have Raspberry Pi, if you're experimenting with uh, 
various distributions. You can have a look and uh, check uh, the content of this file right now. The great thing. Sorry. Okay. So the great thing that I really enjoy in Raspberry Pi is this secondary I squared C bus on pins 27 and 28, which allows you to attach an EEPROM to flash the device binary overlay in this EEPROM. So you don't need to, act, uh, to manually edit config.txt file because while booting, the operating system uh, will read uh, whatever you have stored in the device tree uh, uh, in the EEPROM. So once you boot the system, uh, you, you can see here, especially on Raspbian, at uh, this path you can see uh, the files that are read from the uh, EEPROM. So how to map the keys in a Linux system? So there is a definition of the Linux key codes here. This is a part of, a uh, very small part of course, but you get the idea, it's the same for all other <laughs> buttons, right? So this is the procedure with the device tree compiler, how you make the, the, the binary out of the source code. Uh, every, all, all this is in, uh, in GitHub, here is the link. And after creating this, you have to create a specific binary uh, which is provided with a bunch of tools that Raspberry Pi Foundation uh, is hosting again in GitHub. So you can, you can make an EEP, uh, EEP file that is going to be flashed on the EEPROM. And how many of you have flashed an EEPROM? Okay, cool. So um, since this is a hobby project, I needed something simple, and I created this add-on board attached to the, again, on the Raspberry Pi. So the flashing is also done on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, for the flashing, I'm attaching it to the, to the first I squared C bus, and after that, after booting the, the board, uh, it's, uh, the EEPROM should be connected to these two pins, and uh, the thing that I just explained about the device tree would, should work. So this is the end result, and this is how I tested it. This is with Raspbian. Uh, Raspbian has some, a bunch of uh, very simple uh, games that are not retro. They're new games, but they have this retro style like the Tetris. Um, you need to play a game to verify that's working or just to, to press the buttons to see that it's uh, happening. If you really want to play retro games, there is this really awesome project that I found out and I believe everyone is familiar with it. It's called RetroPie and it's a GNU Linux distribution that is optimized for playing uh, retro games on Raspberry Pi uh, as well as a few other uh, boards uh, like Odroid and uh, personal computers of course with uh, Debian and Ubuntu. So it provides a bunch of emulators but it does not provide a ROM file. Uh, due to you know, uh, copyright concerns because of the uh, developers of these old games. I'm not going to, to do a deep dive in, uh, in, uh, in RetroPie, but there are a lot of links. So those of you who have Raspberry Pi, and this is pretty much all of you, can visit there, download the RetroPie. After that, you can find interesting ROMs and pl play those retro games. How many of you are already uh, using RetroPie? Okay. The rest of you, should, you should try it. So, the problem with a RetroPie that I've experienced, despite all the things that I did with the device tree, binary overlay, and so on, is that some of the emulators were actually not working. The buttons were working within the menus provided by Emulation Station and RetroPie, but I had a problem playing the games uh, within some, some particular games in some particular emulators. So what I did, is to actually hack a simple, very simple Python script that uh, converts the clicks into, into uh, signals uh, that are, can be processed by the emulators. So here are the steps. It's again open source how to get it working if you are creating similar similar board. Okay, so this is pretty much this is it. Um, just the conclusions. Um, although Gaming is pretty much for entertaining. Entertaining, It provides an excellent opportunity for grown-ups as well as for kids to learn new things by making things, do-it-yourself things, and after that playing games on them. 
Uh, there are a lot of free and open source software tools, so you can do this for free, at least the design, and uh, making a very simple two-layer board as this one that you saw is very affordable nowadays, so it's easy to make the hardware as well. KiCad is a um, high-quality free and open source software to do it. There are other softwares as well. Picking up the uh, electronic design automation tool is a matter of religion, <laughs> so if you're using something else, that's, that's totally fine. For me, it's, uh, it's KiCad. Uh, another cool thing is to make uh, one step further, to make it open source, to make it open source hardware, and to certify it at the Open Source Hardware Association. This way, uh, you show supp some support to, the, uh, to this open source hardware movement. Okay. And um, thank you very much. We still have like five minutes for questions. I have some small gifts for anyone who asks a question. The gifts require soldering. <laughs> okay. <laughs> are there any questions? How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you want one? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> All right. So the question was, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm doing fine. Would you like to uh, uh, to do some soldering? I didn't have a, a Raspberry Pi with that. So that's <laughs> All right. That's okay. <laughs> so yes, when, uh, this seems fairly easy, but still, even though the electronics is simple, you have to learn a lot about how, as an example, to work with the device tree and so on. So all in all, it seems like a good uh, educational project for young you know, kids uh, doing development and so on. But at the same time, it still shows that it becomes more complicated today than in the past to learn about everything you need in order to do what is still a simple device. So first, thank you for doing that because this is useful. I mean, it can be used by others to teach young people, uh, young uh, kids, I mean. But, but still, it's not as easy as, is, as it used to be. I, I don't know, have you used it yourself to uh, try and teach young kids? Uh, OK, so the question is, have I used uh, this to, um, to teach young kids because it seems pretty complex, right? Especially the device tree part. This is the, sh the short version, okay. Uh, so I haven't tried yet to learn, uh, to, to teach uh, young kids about device tree. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about this, but what I have done in mo my hometown, Povdy, Bulgaria, is that sometimes we make uh, retro gaming, and uh, it's fairly easy to get a few Raspberry Pis to give them to the kids so that they can, you know, just play and uh, the Raspberry Pi is cheap, so even if something breaks, it's easy to fix it or to buy a replacement. If we bring an, something that's really a retro computing, uh, sometimes it's uh, quite hard to repair it. <laughs> so this is for you. <laughs> yes, over there. Could you please? Uh, you mentioned that you included sandbox. Ah, OK. So just to repeat the question. Um, what I'm using the sensors for, right? So yes, uh, I've added a tree. So just to see where, where was it? Okay, so over here there are three I squared C slots that are attached to pin uh, to the primarily I squared C bus of Raspberry Pi. The idea is that I put sensors on them so that when I'm not playing the games, which is pretty much all the time, <laughs> I can. <laughs> I have to work. <laughs> uh, uh, I can monitor the temperature, the light in my room. So pretty much it's not just, uh, just a toy, but it's something that could be convenient for you know, more practical things. And it's a good excuse for the people in the house to say, hey, I'm not playing games. I'm working on this uh, weather station, you know. <laughs> OK, uh, could you please pass it? Uh, there are two questions over there. Okay, so just to repeat the question, what is the benefit of the open source hardware certification? Well, there is no direct benefit, but this way you're supporting the community, and one, one day if we have a very big open source hardware directory of certified projects, it is going to be easier for other people to go there and to see that, yes, this is really an open source hardware project. Over the years, and I'm, I'm buying a lot of things, I have seen a lot of companies claiming that it's open source hardware without providing 
all the schematics or just providing PDFs. So going through the Open Source Hardware Association, uh, you can easily identify that, yes, what you're buying, what you're seeing there, it's really open source hardware. If you get it, if you decide to modify it, you can do it. Okay, so, so uh, just to repeat, uh, is this just another way to share your open source hardware designs because you can always upload them to, to GitHub? Yes, that's true. And you, actually, for my designs, I'm also uploading them to GitHub. It's just a certification directory where you can go and uh, check out what, what's there. You can, you can give it a try, actually. OK, and um, can, you, can you come after that to grab it? <laughs> All right. And there was another question. Okay, so the question is, why have I choose Raspberry Pi Zero for retro gaming instead of a compute module or another Raspberry Pi model? Uh, so the answer is quite straightforward because I have done in the past simple, uh, similar add-on boards, and uh, these add-on boards work with any Raspberry Pi model and version with 40-pin header. You can do the same way with a Raspberry Pi 3B, B+, or A+. It's, uh, it's totally fine because they're uh, uh, absolutely compatible for the compute the for the compute module uh, it's a little bit uh, more for a kind of a industrial things it requires more more efforts here my goal was to make something that's uh, super low cost super simple <laughs> that's why I, uh, I, uh, I decided to go for a uh, Raspberry Pi 0 3 and so on yes uh, there is one question yeah. Yeah. Very practical question. Uh, how many did you make and how much did you spend on it Okay, so the question is how many of them have I done and is it affordable to do them, right? Okay, so what I'm doing, because obviously uh, uh, soft, making software is easier and cheaper because you can fail cheaper. Uh, what I'm doing is that after making an open source hardware product, I run crowdfunding campaigns at, at CrowdSupply and uh, this way I fund uh, low, low uh, volume manufacturing. These are not very interesting to people. It's more for workshops that I'm doing locally. I have done, I don't know, maybe 100 or something like that. And actually tomorrow I'll have another talk in, uh, in the CAD room where I'll just speak uh, how is the process for manufacturing uh, low volumes from the perspective of a software engineer. And I have to say whatever I say about hardware, take it with a pinch of salt because I'm a software guy. <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, I think there's one more question. So the, the, the question is, uh, is uh, maybe the, the same in either of uh, 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 What does it cost to print the circuit? Okay, so the question is, how, how much does it cost to create the circuit? Um, for example, if you just need a prototype, there are several companies, I'll mention them in my presentation tomorrow, like OSH Park and a few others, where you can go there and make a prototype, like just three prototypes, and uh, it's fairly cheap. I cannot say exactly how, but they have a calculator, so you can go to my GitHub page, download the, the, the thing that I have done, and you can upload it to uh, OSH Park and see the exact price. Yes. Um, is there time for another question? Keep in mind, I'm running out of boards. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to, to leave some room for the, the PHP guys. Uh, thank you very much. Please come by to, to get uh, everyone who asked the question. Do you have the